So these are the letters that we've learned so far. We have gone through 14 letters, three of which have a final form. And so we have basically gone through two sets of seven, two different cycles. And so we've kind of organized these into three different sets of seven. The first seven that we put on the first menorah, we call this, this first row, this is really the gospel. This is the truth of God's desire and his relationship desire to have a relationship with us through Yeshua. And so those were the first seven letters. The second seven letters was, it is a picture of our um, walk as believers in Messiah. And so we learn about what it means to follow Christ and how to live this life and be a disciple of Yeshua. And so we begin our next set. I'm going to erase these because they don't really go with the, the last set. The last set of seven begins with the 15th letter, which is the Samet, and that's what we'll be talking about tonight. But that begins our third and final menorah, that we'll have six more letters that we'll talk about, and then the letter top is the last letter. That's the final letter. It kind of is set apart on its own, um, but that will be the last of the Hebrew letters that we'll talk about. I guess there are. So, um, I will do our story. Because um, it's repetition, and hopefully by the end of this, you guys can tell the story yourself um, to people that you want to share this with. And so we start with the Aleph, which is the father. The Bet represents the son. We have the Aleph and the Bet joined together is the Hebrew word for father. And so we know that Yeshua and the father are one. The father and the, and the son are one. And together, they send forth the Gimel, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit, the function of the Holy Spirit of bringing blessing and health and nourishment and life to the Dalit. The Dalit's the fourth letter. It represents a door. It's a picture of broken humanity. And that when we hear the knock of the Gimel on the door of our heart, we respond to the Holy Spirit in such a way that we allow God to breathe the hay, the breath, the spirit of life into us, which awakens us to new life. And we understand that the only way that we have this new life is through the Vav. The Vav is the nailed man. It's a picture of Yeshua nailed to the cross, but that is our connection. The Vav is the connection from heaven to earth, that Yeshua is our connection. He is the breath of life that we receive by the power of the Holy Spirit when he breathes into us. Once we are connected now to God through Yeshua, the nailed man, we are given the Zion, which is a weapon. That is the weapon of the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, which is both our nourishment, our breath of life, and also our weapon against the enemy. That moves us to the second set, beginning with the eighth letter, which is the Het. The Het is a picture of a wedding canopy. It's the grace and mercy of God that invites us to join him underneath the canopy of his love and enter into this communion with him, this covenant with him. Um, and then we move on to the Tet. The Tet is a picture of conception. So we're married to God and we begin to conceive. Now, if we are, we continue in and under that canopy of his presence, and we understand the tent means the goodness of God, then we are going to be conceived with the spirit of life. But if we look at what surrounds us, which is evil, and, and we allow the enemy to entangle us with the cords of his strangling death, we will fall into the traps of Satan and the snares of the enemy. So it reminds us that we are completely dependent. We have to humble ourselves before the nailed man to receive the power power of life, which is, rep which is represented by the yo. It's a picture of a hand. It's, it's humble, and it sits above the line, but it's it's the Spirit of God that is at work in the believer. And so we, we allow the Holy Spirit to come inside us. We begin to grow with the Spirit of God inside of us, and then that leads us to the cock, which is a picture of the grace and, and the power of God that is poured out upon the believer, that is with their hands raised. God, I want more of your glory. And so the glory of God comes over the believer, and now we begin to take what God has done in us, and we begin to move now in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's upon us. We move in power and anointing to do the work of the kingdom. But we also need to remember the lawman. The lawman sits above of all the letters, it's a picture of the shepherd king, that we have to know that where we are rooted and grounded, we have to abide and remain and let Yeshua be our teacher. He is our shepherd. This is a picture of the shepherd's staff, and he's going to lead us beside still waters. He's going to restore us, and he's going to be um, the one who guides us in everything that we do. When we do this, we become like the lawman, rise above, we're like a city on the hill, letting the light shine through our lives. 
And then out of our bellies are going to flow rivers of living water. And that's what the mem is. It's a picture of a living water of life flowing out of us as we remain and abide in Yeshua, our teacher. We last week we talked about the noon. This is the 14th letter. The noon is a picture of the faithful servant. And it's a picture, it's a, the word um, is a, a fish. And so it reminds us uh, that when we are in this living water, it is the life of the believer. That as we are um, abiding in him, as we are moving in the spirit, we are truly his disciples. We are becoming fishers of men. We are going into all the world. We are bringing people into the kingdom of God. Um, and we become the, the picture of the faithful servant. The moon is a picture of the faithful servant. And we remember God's faithfulness, too, as we look at the letter moon. So those are the two cycles that we have completed. And that moves us to the 15th letter, which is the psalmic. Okay, and so let's talk about what this letter is. I'm going to be quick. Okay. Okay, so the third menorah, this, this third line that we're going to begin building tonight is a picture of really the um, encouragement, or I'll say the promises and the warnings that God gives us, okay, in our walk with the Lord. And so that's what these next seven letters are going to focus on. <coughs> the Psalmet is the 15th, oh, and I have, yeah, please pass this out. Thank you. All right. So the psalm is the fifteenth letter, and just as we talked about how the yo has the value of ten, and then the cop is twenty, a long of thirty, the min is forty, the new is fifty, the year of jubilee. Then the psalmic is going to be 60. So it's the 15th letter, but the value of the psalmic is 60. And the pictograph, if you want to look at the worksheet that you have, shows that the very first time that the psalmic was written, it was written in the form of a prop or a support. Okay? And that agrees with the meaning of the word psalmic, which means to uphold, to support. And so we're going to build this idea of the, the psalmic being a support, something that strengthens, that lifts up, that encourages, that holds up. I mean, that's what this word means, to prop, to aid, to assist, to strengthen, and even laying hands on, meaning that if I'm falling, I, put, I lay my hands on something, this becomes my support, and that's where we get um, that idea Part of what laying the hands on means is to find support in. And so we'll build that idea. The very first, well, one of the, so what I'm going to do now is just going to go through a few scriptures where we have the word psalmic, or at least the letters that spell psalmic. If you look in that keyword box, you see that the 15th letter is spelled psalmic, mem, the final cough. The word that means, that has the same letters, it just has a different vowel mark, so it's samak instead of samek, means to support and uphold. And then we can see a few other words that have that, that start with the samek that have that same idea. Sa'ad means to support, help, assist, or feed. And then sabal means to bear a burden, to, to hold something up. And so this is the main idea of the letter samek, as a support. So I'm going to read a few scriptures that have the word samak or a, a derivation. Derivation. How do you say that? Derivation. Derivation. Thank you. Who <laughs> said that? Of that word in, um, in these few verses. So we'll start with Psalm 37, verse 17. It says, For the power of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. And that word upholds is the psalmic. Okay, so you have the psalmic command in the final call. So the Lord is upholding the righteous. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 8, um, this is the, the context is the story of um, King Hezekiah, and they are being attacked by the Assyrian army led by Sennacherib, and they're coming to surround Judah to defeat 
Jerusalem, and Hezekiah is going to encourage the people of Israel, the people of Judah, with um, these words that are going to support them. He is talking about the difference between the um, the God or the um, God of Sennacherib and the God of Israel. And he says, with him is an arm of flesh, talking about the evil king, and he's nothing. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And it says this, the people rested themselves upon the words of King Hezekiah. Meaning, that's the, and that's the summit. They put, they, they leaned upon, they were encouraged by the words that Hezekiah said. The words that he spoke concerning the truth about who our God is became something that supported them. It propped them. It lifted them up. It allowed them to walk by faith and not by sight. They were able to trust in the word of God. And that's this whole idea of what the Semek means, to prop, to lift up, to be a support for. They could rest on the words that King Hezekiah said because they knew that they were true. And it built up their faith and it encouraged them. Okay, these are the ideas behind the word summit. We see in Psalm 119, which is an acrostic psalm. Um, if you guys don't know that, you can go to Psalm 119 and you'll find every single one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet broken down with eight verses. Okay, all of them to up. And so when you look at the eight verses that are connected to the Psalmet, what you'll find is that each line begins with the Psalmet. And so we can read in Psalm 119, verse 116, in the Psalmet portion of this psalm, it says, Uphold me according to your promise, that I may live, and let me not be put to shame, put, let me not be put to shame in my hope. That word, the very first word, uphold, is the summit. Okay, uphold me according to your promise. God, support me with your truth. Allow me to be assisted and strengthened by your everlasting word. I like to think of the psalmic also in the visual that we have when Moses is there um, and, and Joshua is fighting the battle of the Amalekites and Moses is on the mountain and his hands are raised to heaven as, as we think about the yo that God he is saying direct your attention to the one who is your God and your king as, as his hands are pictures of the yo but the two men Aaron and her that come beneath him beside him become a summit they become a support for him by, by putting their arms underneath him and even the rock that he set upon was a picture of Yeshua the rock of our salvation who is our our support and our strength and our help in time of need. And so these men, along with the rock that he was able to sit on, he was able to put his weight upon, he was leaning upon because he trusted and he knew that God would strengthen, that God would support, that that becomes a beautiful picture displaying the truths of what the Somnek is. And the Somnek is going to be connected to the priest and the priestly blessing. And so I'm going to try to... Um, to show you guys how this is connected. This is within Jewish literature and understanding, but it's really amazing how these two things are connected. The first connection comes with the idea that whenever the priests were to bring a sacrifice to the Lord, that they were to lay their hands on that sacrifice. Okay, so there's actually this word, samek, laying the hands on, um, particularly in the passage concerning the Day of Atonement. Okay, the Day of Atonement, the holiest day of the year, the day that the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, before he did that, they would do two things. They would bring two goats before the priest, right? And one of the goats was going to be used for the sacrifice, to make the blood sacrifice over the altar. The other goat, the priest was to lay his hands upon that goat and basically transfer the sin of the people onto the, that animal, and that animal would take the sins out of the camp as he was taken to the wilderness and basically remove the sin from the people. Okay, that was the idea behind the sacrifice. It's a picture. But it's in that, that process of the priest laying their hands upon that we see that word cement. They would lay their hands on. And so what that represents is one, the transfer of the sins of the people onto the animal, but also showing that that animal was a support for the people. That that animal, that sacrifice was something that God was using to support them, to uphold them, to strengthen them, because it was through that sacrifice, one was going to be used as a blood sacrifice to atone for their sin, and the other was going to remove the sin from them. So those animals became something that supported the people, it strengthened them, and upheld them. 
And so we have this connection between the Salmet and the priests. So the priests were going to bring sacrifices before God. And the other thing primarily that they're going to do is they're going to bless the people. Okay, God um, wants to have this relationship with us. Okay, and the priests were a mediator. Okay, they were a picture of Yeshua, our high priest. That they became a mediator between God and the people. Their sacrifices were there so that the blood could atone for their sins, that they could have a communion with God. That they could be near to him, right? That's what why the Day of Atonement happened every year, so that people could draw near to God. Well, God also wants to bless the people. He wants to draw near to them, but he also wants to pour out his blessing. And God shows his desire to bless us in Deuteronomy chapter 28. He's talking about when you obey the voice of the Lord. He says, All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. We get this idea of God desiring to pour out a tsunami of blessing upon his people. He wants them to overtake. Us, chase us down and pour out upon us. That's the heart of God. That when you walk in my ways, when you walk in my commandments, I want my blessing to overtake you, to be completely overwhelmed and consumed by the blessing of God. Okay, that's to God's heart. And so there's one blessing, though, that God commands the priest to say over the people. And that blessing is what we call the priestly blessing or the ironic blessing. And it's from um, Numbers chapter 6. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, because Aaron and his sons were the Levites. They were the priests that God had chosen to be this mediator between him and the people. And he said to them, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his perfect shalom. So this blessing God commanded the priest to say over the people. And it's a very important and significant blessing within Judaism. And it's one that you will hear every time you go to a synagogue because it's a blessing commanded by God to say over the people. So the way that the priests would do this is that they would stand up and they would actually put their hands in the shape of the letter Sheen, which is one of the last letters we'll talk about. But they, they, they make a sheen with their hand and they stretch out their arms like they are laying their hands upon the people. And they are asking God to transfer his blessing upon the people. Okay, and so they they they, they stand up and they and they declare these words as they outstretch their hands to the people, and the people are to receive the blessing from God. We're gonna look at this blessing and we're gonna see this amazing connection between the letter Samak and this blessing. So on your worksheet. Yeah. Um, kind of in the middle there, you see the, the priestly blessing. We see the Hebrew and then the English translation underneath. So we're going to look at this blessing, and what we're going to see is something really amazing, the way that this is constructed in the Hebrew. First of all, we notice that it's three lines. Well, you know, the rabbis, they just sit there and they study the Torah. They study the, the letters. They study the numbers. They, they just spend so much time just reading and reading the Torah. This is what they are called to do. And so they begin to notice these patterns. And one thing that we see, as we count the Hebrew words on the first line, um, we see that there are three of them. On the second line, we see that there are five words. On the third line, we see that there are seven words. Okay, you can count them. Three, five, seven. Well, let's, so the rabbi said, well, let's count the letters. On the first line we count, we can count an hour later, but there are 15 letters. On the second line, there are 20 letters. On the third line, there are 25 letters. So what we're seeing is this building up, this tidal wave, this tsunami that God wants to pour upon his people. When we add the words, we get 15. When we add the letters, we get 60. The Psalmic is the 15th letter with the numerical value of 60. And so what the rabbis say is that this blessing that God desires to be the tsunami of blessing to pour out upon his people is connected to the Psalmic. Because the Psalmic, this is how God wants to support us. This is how God wants to strengthen us. This is how God wants to be our prop, to assist us and to uplift us, to lift us up and to encourage us and to surround us. Look at the way that the Samek is constructed. There's no hole here. It is a continual piece, and it's, it's almost, besides this little piece on the end, it's almost a complete circle. 
And so the rabbis say that this is a picture of the eternal support and love and, and that, that the strength that God desires to provide for his people. They actually imagine that the people of God are inside the Salmet and God is surrounding his people with his um, support and his strength and he is protecting them inside of the people are in here. God's strength and protection and support is around his people. And so they make this connection between the priestly blessing and this letter Salmet as they, they see the, the similarities in this blessing. One of the other amazing things about this is that as they outstretch their arms, they look and consider there are 27 bones in your hand and there are three bones in your arm. That's 30 bones on this arm and 30 bones on this arm, which equals 60. But the, the numerical value of the Salmet, that even as they outstretch their arms, their arms become a picture of the support that God desires to bring his people. We don't have time to go into what all of um, the priestly blessing means. I've done a teaching on this before, and I'd love to send you guys that teaching. And, and even how um, I broke down all the words and kind of embellished it a little bit with all the meanings hidden in these words. And so I'll send that out to you. It's really a beautiful blessing that God says over his people. The first one I'll just say, because it blows your mind, the first thing when it says the Lord bless you, that idea of blessing means that God wants to get on his knees and give you a gift. That the God of the universe who created us desires to get low, to bow before you and offer you a gift. It's the heart of God. It's, it's a, an amazing thing, but it goes on and on and on. And it's this tsunami of blessing and life that God just wants to pour out upon us. And the reason he says this, he says, as you do this, as you make this blessing over the people, I'm going to put my name upon them. The world's going to know that I'm God because I've blessed my people. It is a picture that points to the world that there is a God who loves us and cares for us and desires us to walk in the fullness of his love and blessing. That's the reason why he wants to bless us. It's to show the world that he is God. It's to give glory to himself. It's not about us. We don't deserve it. And that's part of what this blessing talks about. But I'll send it to you. It's really, really awesome. But the rabbi, so I'm going to read a little excerpt from, um, in his own words, because I just love how he describes this. It says that the Jewish sages believe that the 60 letters comprising the priestly blessing are what Solomon alluded to when he wrote this. This is from the Song of Solomon, chapter 3. He says, look, it's Solomon's carriage, escorted by 60 warriors, the noblest of Israel, all of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared for the terrors of the night. So they make this connection that these 60 letters are like the 60 warriors that surround Solomon. Okay, they surround him in such a way that there's no way that the enemy can enter. No weapon formed against Solomon is going to prosper because the 60 warriors that surround Solomon become this support, this help, this structure around that does not allow the enemy to penetrate. And so the sages say that these 60 letters are just like Solomon's warriors. They surround you and they protect you and they become this, this shield that keeps the enemy away. And those first lines, may the Lord bless you and keep you, keep you. That whole idea of God keeping you is God surrounding you with his sheltering presence. And so they connect these 60 warriors with these 60 letters in this priestly blessing. And so he continues on. He says, we must understand that the priestly blessing is of extreme importance as if it's the only blessing commanded by God for use by the priest. Therefore, the 60 letters comprising it are viewed as 60 warriors prepared to do battle against Israel's spiritual enemies. Let us never underestimate the protective influence of God's word when it is declared in faith and obedience. So I just encourage you guys to say and receive those blessings over yourself as God brings 60 warriors surrounding you, sheltering you in his presence as we declare that in faith and obedience. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lift his countenance upon you and give you perfect shalom. I actually say that every day over my children, at least a variation of it. And I believe that as I say those words, that God is surrounding them. He's keeping them. And I believe that with faith and obedience, I say it over them, believing that God's word will accomplish its purpose of putting his name upon them so the world can know that he alone is God. 
You know, that is a powerful, powerful thing. And it's connected to this letter, Samek, because the Samek is a picture of God supporting us. And I love that idea. There's a psalm that says, um, Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. This is Psalm 512. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. And I just can't get over the fact that I put, I put a shield down here because look at how it looks just like a stomach. It's a shield. It's a shield of protection. It's a shield that surrounds us with his favor, keeping us and not allowing any weapon to be prosper that's formed against us. So the, the, the structure of it speaks to the nature of it as being an eternal and complete protection and support. The very first time that we see the letter Samek is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 11. And it's in reference to the rivers, the four rivers that flow from the Garden of Eden. And in one of the rivers, it says that it surrounds the garden, okay? And that is that Hebrew word that begins with the Samek. So anytime a word is going to begin with this letter, it's going to have this idea of, of surrounding and supporting. Okay, what does the water do? The water is going to support life, right? And so this is a this we want to make this connection with the psalmic not only really as a support, but something that surrounds and protects. Okay? And so we see that idea in Genesis chapter 2, verse 11. And here that word is not samek, but it has the samek in it, but then it has a bet, a yod, and a bet. Okay, so we're going to see that same word that means to surround, okay, that has that idea of surrounding, protecting, supporting, helping, assisting, all those ideas wrapped up in that letter Samek. We see that same word in Psalm 125, verse 2. And here it's used in this way. It says, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. So God is saying, I am just like that blessing that I say over you, it's more than just the words I say, it's who I am. I surround you. I, I am a shield about you. Okay, so God is saying, just as the mountains surround, and that's that word that we saw, it's actually it's pronounced sub, sabiv, okay, or sabev. It surrounds Jerusalem, like the mountains surround Jerusalem, so I surround my people. He's saying, you are in the, in the middle of the Samek. You are in the sheltering presence, and I surround you with my favor like a shield. I surround you, and we even see it um, later on in Isaiah. It says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. Oh, that's not the right one. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. But all of those ideas when you hear, I will strengthen, I will uphold, I will, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. Do not, all those things, I'm sorry. I will strengthen and I will hold. Those two things, that is the summit. He is going to strengthen and uphold his people. But the one I wanted to point out was, um, I'm going to put it somewhere else. It says, you are my hiding place. So God is saying, in me, okay, you, I am your hiding place. It says, you will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. So God desires that we would all rest inside the Samek, that that would be a chamber of safety, a bridal chamber, a place where we are protected and sheltered, that inside that Samek, as he surrounds us with his support and his love, we will find protection and shelter and, and safety in the midst of him. And I love that it even says here that I will surround you with songs of deliverance. So there is a, a victory that's associated with this letter. We recognize that we are in his presence and that the weapons will not prosper that are formed against us. And I even, I put on here, I mean, down here is a harp. Again, that song of deliverance, it's the same shape. <laughs> the shape, the ancient harp that David had looks like a sumac. And so it's the song of deliverance. It's the, the shield of protection. It's all of these things that are connected. Um, okay. All right, so I'm going to turn now, if you guys could turn with me, to Jeremiah chapter 31.
Okay, so Jeremiah chapter 31, this should be a familiar passage for you guys. This is the passage where it talks about the new covenant that God is going to make with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Um, we recognize or understand the new covenant in context with what Jesus did and that he has made a way for us to come to God through faith. And so this, and part of this new covenant was that God is going to put his spirit inside of the people. And he says, I'm going to write my Torah, my law on your heart. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a, verse, a couple verses in Jeremiah 31 and show you how, uh, how the Sumnac is seen in this chapter. So in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 21 and 22, we have a very interesting couple verses here. God is basically calling Israel, who in this time when this was written, Israel is backslidden. Israel is fornicating with other gods. Israel could be considered a prostitute. And prostitution in spiritual context means that she is worshiping other gods. She is not remaining faithful to the God of Israel. She is fornicating. She is turned away. She is, is, a, is a whore. Right? This is what the spiritual language, how, it, how it's depicted in the scripture. But here in verse 21, God says these words. He says, come back, virgin Israel. And I love how he calls Israel a virgin in this scripture. Because right now, Israel is anything but a virgin. She is fornicating. She is unfaithful. But just as God, as Yeshua prophesied to Peter and called him a rock when he was anything but a rock, it wasn't until Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 that he became who Jesus said he would always be. Whenever Jesus has this interchange with Simon, and he asks him, who do you say that I am? And Simon answers, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He says to him, and I will call you Peter, because you are going to be a rock, Peter. Right now, even, even before you're a rock, though, you're going to be 93 times, right? He was going to be as shifting as the sand. But Yeshua spoke what is not as it is. And he prophesied into the heart of Peter and said, Peter, you are a rock. He's doing it right here to Israel. They are a prostitute in this moment. But God is saying, virgin Israel, he's calling forth their destiny. He's calling forth who he's created them to be. You are virgin Israel. And he says, Come back. Come back to me. Come back to these cities of yours. And he says, how long will you hesitate, you unruly daughter? How long are you going to wait? Because God is faithful and God will wait as long as it takes. But he's crying out to them, virgin Israel, come back to me. How long will you wait, wait unruly daughter? And then he says something so amazing. He says, for the Lord has created something new on the earth, a woman who encircles a man. What is God talking about here? This word for encircles or surrounds or it might read something. It might read strengthen. Wow. It's a sonic. It's that same word used in Genesis chapter 2 for the river that surrounds. It's that same word that we read in Psalm when God says, I'm going to surround my people. What God is saying here, as he calls Israel forth in her destiny, he is saying, I'm doing a new thing in your heart, Israel. I am making you a faithful, eternal covenant partner. Because this idea of surrounding, okay, this idea of the Samek, you are going to support me. You are going to come by my side and be the support. In the Hebrew tradition, when a man and wife are being married and part of the ceremony, the bride, when she comes up to her groom, she encircles her husband seven times, showing the, the completeness of her devotion to him. She basically makes a salmek around him seven times, showing her eternal commitment to him, how she is going to support him, she is going to encourage him, she is going to lift him up, she is going to assist him. She is basically binding herself to him as she circles around him. He is saying, Virgin Israel, I am going to make you my bride. You are going to encircle around, you are going to surround me, and you are going to be joined to me for eternity. 
So God is speaking to Israel and calling forth their destiny to say that you are going to be my people and I am going to be your God. And the only way that that's going to happen is because I am going to support you. I am going to put my spirit in you and you are going to be my people. I am going to write my Torah on your heart. It's not going to be like it was before. You're going to be able to do this because I will be your Samek. I will be your support. I will uphold you. I will lift you up. I will encourage you. I will be faithful to you, and you will be faithful to me. We will be each other so much. And that is the whole point of why God created Eve as the bride. She was his helper, right? She was to be his helper, his support, the one to assist him, to encourage him, to strengthen him. Okay, that was the function of Eve as the bride. And he's saying, I'm going to make you come into your destiny as my bride. You are going to be my submit, but the only way you're going to get there is by me being first being your submit. As I support you and as I uphold you, as I lift you up. I'm doing a new thing, Israel. A woman is encircling a man. And that man is God. It's a picture of God. You are going to be my bride and we are going to be connected in this eternal picture of you're coming into the bridal chamber and no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. I'm going to surround you. I'm going to keep you. You're going to be mine. It's a picture of Yeshua. Absolutely. The bride circling Yeshua. Yes. Absolutely. That's his bride. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's so cool. I love it. Okay. <clears throat> so, last thing about the Salmech before we go to Revelation chapter 15. So, we have here, the noon, and then following the noon is the Salmech. I'm going to bring it up here just to show the order here. So in the order of the Hebrew letters, it goes Mem, Noon, Salmech. So here we have the noon. If we remember, the noon means one who is faithful, one who is bent over in humility, but one who remains, who's steady, who's true. And so we have this idea that, that the noon as a bent over, someone who basically needs a little support, okay? Because they're bent in humility, but God promises that he's going to lift up all of those who are bent over. So the psalmic, as it follows the noon, is a picture of God's being faithful to those who have humbled themselves, who have, who have, who have fallen. It's that idea of either falling or humbling yourself. Either way, God says, I'm going to support you. If you are faithful and you are Walking in humility, I'm going to exalt you and lift you up on the last day. If you have made mistakes and you're stumbling and you're falling and you need some support, I'm going to lift you up. And so we have this verse in Psalm 145, 14, and I believe it's on the sheet that I handed out. And it says, the Lord upholds all those who fall. And he lifts up all those who are bowed down. And what I did here is I put the Salmech and the Noon in each place. The Lord upholds, or the Lord Salmech, all those who fall, Noon. He lifts up, Salmech, all those who are bowed down, Noon. So God puts these two letters <coughs> right here together in this alphabet to show that those who remain faithful, who have fallen, who have, who have humbled themselves, God is going to lift up. He is going to be your support. And then we put those two letters together and we get the Hebrew word for miracle. Yes, that it's going to be a miracle that God, as he exalts those who are humble, as he lifts up those who are broken, it's the definition of miracle. These two letters together, as you read that, you can understand miracle to be God's faithful support. That when you are in need of someone to strengthen you, support you, lift you up, that we can count on God's faithfulness to do that for us because he is the one who brings these miracles in our lives. Yeah. All right, so now we're going to move into Revelation. So, what does that mean? Lift up. Yeah. I have thought, Cynthia, so it's kind of like a, a horseshoe with a lid on us. Yeah. And so when you talk about the rabbi saying, we go we go in there, we're surrounded by the six street warriors, because of our free will and our choice, I wonder if we can lift that lid up if we want to. Good thought. Just some thought. 
Okay, Revelation chapter 15. Oh, sorry, I just noticed one more thing. Going back to this idea of the Samek being, you know, we talked about connecting to the priest and the Day of Atonement and how God wants to support us. All of those ideas, they actually do a, um, they think of, thank you. They think of the Samek as an anachronism. So, these are the letters of the Salmec. This is the Salmec, the men, and the final cough. And so this is how the, the sages say that God wants to support us, and it's connected to all of these things. They say that this is actually um, the start of another word, and this is the Hebrew word salak, which means to forgive. Okay? This Hebrew word that starts with the men is the word mechal, which means to pardon. And then the dot or the cough, I'm sorry, the large dot, which is a cough, the final cough. The word that starts with the cough is the Hebrew word kapir, kafir, which means to atone. So this is how God supports his people by forgiving, pardoning, and atoning them for their sins. So I just think that's really cool as we connect that to this whole idea of the, the day of atonement. In the way that God desires to surround us, that he surrounds us and protects us because he's a God who forgives. He's a God who pardons. He's a God who atones for our sin. This is how God shows his support and his love for his people. Okay, now for real, Revelation chapter 15. Okay. So let's turn to the book of Revelation. So before we read Revelation chapter 15, we are going to actually go back to Revelation chapter 11 because we talked about how Revelation 11 really is the end of the story of what happens before Jesus returns. Okay, basically it's we can find the conclusion there of the return of our Messiah and the, the bowls of wrath being poured out. So we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 11, and we're going to basically understand here that Revelation chapter 15 is going to be a more detailed explanation of what happens between verses 15 and 19 in Revelation 11. So I'm going to read those verses, and then what we'll do is we'll go into Revelation 15 and see how we get more details of what we just are going to read here in Revelation 11. So, the seventh angel sounded his shofar, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will rule forever and ever. The 24 elders sitting on their thrones in God's presence fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We thank you, Lord, God of heaven's armies, the one who is and was, that you have taken your power and you have begun to rule. The Gentiles rage, but now your rage has come. For time, the time for the dead to be judged, the time for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your holy people, those who stand in awe of your name, both small and great, it is also the time for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God in heaven was opened. The ark of the covenant was seen in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning, voices, peals of thunder, and earthquake and violent hail. So we see the sound of the seventh shofar blast, which brings the final judgments of God, but also brings back Yeshua. So Yeshua is returning to bring his own unto himself, and at the same time to bring judgment and wrath, the final judgments of God, which we call the wrath of God, to the unbelievers and Satan and his evil kingdom. So that's basically what's happening in this last section of Revelation chapter 11. So let's switch over back to Revelation chapter 15, and we're going to get more details about what we just read. So I'll read this chapter, and then we'll break it down. There's just two sections here that we need to talk about. Chapter 15, verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, a great and wonderful one. Seven angels with the seven plagues are the final ones, because with them God's fury is finished. I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Those defeating the beast, its image, and the number of its name were standing by the sea of glass, holding harps which God had given them. They were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb. 
Great and wonderful are the things you have done, Lord, God of heaven's armies. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. The Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? Because you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. After this I looked, and the sanctuary, that is the tent of witness in heaven, was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, bright linen and had gold belts around their chest. One of the four living beings gave to the seven angels seven gold bowls filled with the fury of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from God's Shekinah glory, that is, from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels had accomplished their purpose. Okay. So the first thing that we notice here is that John sees another sign, and he calls it a great and wonderful sign. But typically, when you think of the wrath of God, you don't first say a great and wonderful sign. But the truth is, is that this is the, this is the completion of God's judgments. And so for the, for the believers, this is the answer to the final answer to all of our prayers, that God is destroying evil. He's completely destroying all evil off of the earth. That is something that is great and wonderful. So John sees this sign as something that we should anticipate. Um, and of course, for those who have not chosen God, it will be a terrible time. But again, we have to go back to understand this idea that God does not force his love. God has given man every opportunity to repent. Even his mercy has been seen in the judgments that have been poured out in the last seven years. Okay, but it's at this moment that God, you know, God has said creation declares his glory. And it's not his desire that any should perish, but all should come to eternal life. So God has done everything in his power to do because he doesn't feel <coughs> so right. Think about your own relationship with your spouse. No one forced you to love him. You chose that love, right? Okay, so that's the same idea with God. He does not force us to love him. He desires us to choose that to choose to walk with him. And so these who who come under the wrath of God are those who raise their fist at God in unbelief and defiance, who have been given over to delusion. And just like Pharaoh, their hearts are hardened towards God. They will not repent. They have chosen this. Even with angels speaking out and declaring the eternal gospel, their ears have been closed to hear. And it's not God's design that they did that. They chose that. And we have to understand that. It is God's desire that none should perish. So the wrath of God is reserved for those who continually say no to God, to refuse his love, refuse his sacrifice. They don't want the atoning sacrifice of Yeshua's blood to cover their sin. And we're going to find out that it doesn't as we get to the end of this chapter. But to John, it's a great and wonderful sign. And we can join him in saying hallelujah as as Yeshua is saying, it is finished and bringing the final place. Um, but here in these next few verses, what we see are the overcomers giving glory to God. So we see right here in verse 2, John says, I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Those defeating the beast, its image, and the number of its name were standing by the sea of glass, holding heart, heart which God had given them. So we saw the sea of glass already once in the book of Revelation. So let's go back to that chapter and look at it again. We saw this in chapter 4. Chapter 4 was like chapter 15 in that it is a heavenly scene where we see the throne of God and the glory of God in this scene. We see in verse 6 this sea of glass. I'll read from verse 4 through 6. So surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and on the thrones sat 24 elders dressed in white clothing, wearing gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came forth lightning, voices, and thunderings, and before the throne were seven flaming torches, which are the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne of what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. So we see the sea of glass here in Revelation chapter 4, and now we see it here again in Revelation chapter 15. Now, if you remember, we talked about what that sea of glass represents and, and how it's actually a heavenly tabernacle, okay? Whenever God gave Moses the design for the tabernacle, it was a pattern after 
the heavenly tabernacle. So what Moses built on earth was a type, a pattern of what of how it looks in heaven. Okay, it's a divine design to show how things are set up in heaven. Okay, so what we see here in this sea is actually a part of the tabernacle. I have to, I guess I'll draw it because I didn't put it all out. So here's a picture of the tabernacle of Moses, not the bottom one, the top one, so I will just draw it. So we have just a big rectangle. <laughs> Okay, so we have the outer courts, the inner courts. Well, maybe this is the outer courts, the inner courts, and then here is the Holy of Holies. Okay? So before you go into the inner courts, you have what is known as the sea. Okay? So this big, Basically, it's like a huge wash bin. It's like it's called a lake of labor and it, because this is where the priests would have to wash. It's basically a picture of baptism. Okay, it's a being cleansed before you go into the holy place. Inside the holy place, you have the menorah, the table of showbread, um, the altar of incense, and then here inside the holy of holies, you have the ark of the covenant, where the presence of God would come and manifest here in the glory cloud. But this is what the sea is, okay? Out here, that's where the Gentiles get to be. Way out here. Can't even get anywhere close to God. <laughs> we'll talk about this and we'll that in a minute. But so this is what we see. And we can read about the sea in um, see, 1 Kings chapter 7. And here's what it says in 1 Kings. It says, The sea was the large metal labor that held 11,000 gallons of water. Actually, this is my talking. 11,000 gallons of water standing in front of the holy place where the priests would wash to make themselves ceremonial clean. Only then would they then be able to enter into the service of God in the temple. So here's what it says in 1 Kings chapter 7. He made the sea of cast metal, circular in shape, 17 and a half feet from rim to rim, eight and three quarters feet high, and 52 and a half feet in circumference. Under its rim, 300 gourds encircled it in two rows. They were cast with the sea. They were cast when the sea was cast. It rested on 12 oxen, three looking north, three looking west, three looking south, and three looking east. Obviously, that number 12 is a picture of the 12 tribes of Israel. The sea was set on top of them. It was a handbreadth thick. Its rim was made like the rim of a cup, like the flower of a lily, which means purity. And its capacity was 11,000 gallons. So this gigantic sea right there in front of the holy place. Okay? So this is a reflection of the heavenly reality. In heaven, as John sees, it is clear and pure. The earthly sea was made of iron, so it was made of metal, so there is a difference. Okay, the sea of glass is a symbolic labor in heaven intended to represent the washing that believers receive when they accept Jesus as their Messiah. So whenever we enter into relationship with God through Yeshua, his blood washes us and makes us clean. And so that is a physical picture of the spiritual reality of us being washed in the blood of Yeshua, okay, before we enter in to the holy place. So that's what that is a picture of. Okay, so what is different about this in Revelation chapter 15? Instead of clear as crystal, we see it's also mixed with fire. It says, I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast, his image, and over the number of his name. So those who stood beside this sea are those who are not just baptized in the water, but they have also been baptized in the fire of the tribulation. Okay, They have endured the tribulation. It says that they have overcome the beast. So these that stand before the throne of God have been baptized not with just the water of Yeshua's sacrifice, but they've been through the fire of God's purifying process 
but they have been through the fires of tribulation. So this fire is a picture both of the refining fire of God's judgments and his, and his, and his, his purifying processes. We have to endure persecution. But it also represents the fire of the judgments of God against those who are in covenant with Satan. So the fire represents two different things here. But these people that have endured the persecution of the beast have come through the fire and now they're standing in the presence of God. Okay. And it says in Revelation chapter 14, as we go back and we look at, we can actually, I'm going to do this another time, but I've started to follow different characters in Revelation, following the 144,000, following Israel, following um, these that have been, that we're talking about right now, and I'm, I'm coming up with a theory, but I can't, I don't have it all yet, so I'll wait till next week. But what we see here, we can see God talking to these people in Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. It says, And I heard a voice from heaven say, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. We see God also talking to this same group of people in Revelation chapter um, 13. He says to them, this is, this is when God's holy people, this is verse 10, this is when God's holy people must persevere and trust, okay? So he is talking to the people who hold fast to the testimony of Yeshua and follow God's commands. I would say that those are Christians, okay? He's talking to believers from the nations that hold fast to the testimony of Yeshua and follow his commands. Okay? So these people that we see in Revelation chapter 15 have gone through the, the waters of baptism and they have gone through the fire of the tribulation and now they stand in the presence of God. God has encouraged these people throughout the book in certain sections to persevere, to endure, to remain st steadfast, to remain faithful, that God's going to get us through. Okay, So here they are. Um, and I want us to notice that where they're standing... It says that they, we, we just saw in Revelation chapter 4 that the sea is right there next to the throne, the throne of God, okay? I believe that, that that wall is removed, okay? That they are in the throne of God. They are next to God in his throne. They are hidden inside with him. Okay. So... I want us to see for a second how far we've come as Gentile believers. <laughs> Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, he's talking to Gentiles. He says, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth, called uncircumcised by those who call themselves circumcised, remember that at one time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. I'm going to read that again. You were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. We were way out here. There was no way for us to get in. There was no way for us to get here with God. We were separated. We were without God. We were without hope in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So we have been brought straight into the holy place by the blood of our salvation of Yeshua. And God has washed us in the water of his, of his son, by the blood of the lamb. And now these that stand before God have gone through the fire of tribulation and they're in the throne room. Those who were far off have been brought near into the very presence of the living God. And they stand there with hearts that have been given them and they sing a song of victory. They sing a song of glory and praise to God. Those who were once far off have been brought near into his presence. It is a beautiful reality that we can look forward to, that God is going to draw us near. He no longer sees our sin. He is, his blood has covered our sin, and we've been brought near to our God. It is a wonderful promise. 
And so this C, okay, this C is a picture of that, but it's also going to remind us of another C, and that's the Red Sea, okay? The Sea of the Story of Exodus. Now follow me here for a minute. So the people of God here in this chapter, Revelation chapter 15, they are standing, it says, I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Those defeating the beast, its image and the number of its name, were standing by the sea of glass. Okay? So this, as it relates to the sea, the Red Sea, we always got to go back to the Passover story because God wants to show his redemption. And so here what's happening is that this is a picture of the sea of the Red Sea. Remember that in the story of the Exodus, that God parted the Red Sea and the people of Israel walked through on dry land. Okay, this was after all of the plagues of Egypt. This was after God brought all the judgment against Egypt. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he and his chariots, they came after Israel into the Red Sea. What did, how did God um, show himself to the people during this time? How did he guide them? He guided them by um, cloud by day and fire by night. So here in this heavenly sea, we see the people of God next to the sea as they see the water and the fire on the water. A picture of God's judgment, but a picture of the presence of God. Do you remember in the story, it says that God surrounded his people, and Pharaoh and his army could not, could not see them. They could not advance toward them, because God has been, he was a sheltering fire around his people. In fact, I thought I wrote that verse here. Um, that's the one I was looking for earlier, but I didn't see it. I'm sure it's on your son. Okay, but here, we, so we're, we're talking about the Red Sea. We're talking about the people of God standing next to the sea as fire flashes across the Great Sea. The people stand by and they watch in victory. So just like we watched God destroy Pharaoh and his army, this is what's about to happen. In these next verses, we're about to see God destroy Satan and his evil kingdom. Okay, so in this moment in heaven, John sees the people next to God. Just like in, in the parted Red Sea, he sees them as they have gone through into the promise of God. They're next to God, and they're about to see that sea crash down over the enemy as God's judgments fall upon the last Pharaoh, Satan, and his evil kingdom. Okay, so it reminds us also of that. Um, and here is where I believe we see that Salmec come into full focus, where we see the connection between the 15th letter and the 15th chapter of Revelation. Because we see in this picture that God has been a support for these for those who have humbled themselves before him. God has lifted them up. He has exalted them and brought them unto himself. He has become the Salmec that surrounds them. He has drawn them near to himself, and he is supporting them. He's protecting them. He's assisting them. He's coming to aid them as he brings destruction upon the enemy. He's bringing protection and eternal fire of his love surrounding his people in this moment. We could read all of those verses that I read about the Salmec in the beginning, we could read that in reference to what's happening here. Um, here's the one I wanted to read. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 5. It says, For I, declares the Lord, and this is that word, remember, for the uh, river that surrounds and the encircling of a man, the Saviv. It says in Zechariah chapter 2, For I, declares the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her, He's talking about Jerusalem, around his people, and I will be the glory in her midst. So God promises to be this wall of fire, this surrounding protection, the summit that supports and upholds his people. And here we see that happening in Revelation chapter 15, as they see, uh, as they're by the sea of glass mixed with fire, that he's surrounding them as he's going to bring his judgment. In fact, Zechariah chapter 2, I would encourage you to read that whole chapter, because that chapter is about God protecting his people in the midst of the judgments that are coming upon the land against Satan and the evil kingdom. So it's actually very, it pertains to this chapter um, exactly. Um, and so 
The point here is, is that God is about to pour out his wrath upon the earth, the final judgments, but he will not do that until he has his own in his presence. Because we know from the promise in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for attaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So a lot of people confuse this with the tribulation. This is not what it says. Yeshua actually says in Matthew that, Take heart, in this world you have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So Yeshua never promised that we would have to endure, not endure tribulation. He says, actually, you will endure tribulation, but I've overcome, so you will also overcome. And that's the picture of the overcomers here in Revelation 15. But on the other side of that, God promised that we are not destined for wrath. And this is specifically what the final seven bold judgments are. They are the wrath of God. It's these last that the wrath of God is finished. It's no longer just called judgments. It's the wrath. It's the day of the Lord. It's the day of fear and trembling. It's a day that is darkness and gloom for those who do not know him. It's a terrible day for those outside of covenant. And so what God has done is he shows us that he is, and these people that are standing before the Lord are those who have been raptured, from Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. These are the harvests that God has brought to himself. They're standing before the Lord. They're hiding so that his wrath can be poured out upon the unbelievers and the wicked. So God is saying, I'm going to support you. I'm your sonic. I'm surrounding you with fire, protection, and I'm pouring out my wrath upon the earth. He's drawing the people in the earth. And I found it very interesting. Um, I'll give you in a second. So what does God do? He gives them hearts, and they begin to sing something that's going to absolutely connect us back to Exodus. What do they sing? The Song of Moses, the Servant of God, and the Song of the Lamb. Let's read the Song of Moses, Exodus chapter 15, Samek. <laughs> I love that. It's not by accident. But Exodus chapter 15 and Revelation chapter 15 are connected because here God says that they are singing the song of Moses. Now the song of Moses is a song with the people of Israel saying right after God delivered them out of Egypt and that and God judged the Egyptian by pouring uh, the sea of the Red Sea pouring out over them and drowning them in the sea. So we'll read this together. Revelation or Exodus 15. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he threw in the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. In Hebrew, what is that, guys? Yeshua. He has become my Yeshua. This is my God. I will glorify him. My Father's God. I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he hurled into the sea. His elite commanders were drowned in the sea of sun. The deep waters covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, is sublimely powerful. Your right hand, Lord, shatters the foe. By your great majesty, you bring down your enemies. You send out your wrath to consume them like stubble. With the blast from your nostrils, the waters piled up. The water stood up like a wall. The depths of the sea became firm ground. The enemy said, I will pursue and overtake, divide the spoil, and forge myself on them. I will draw my sword. My hand will destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, Lord, among the mighty? Who is like you, sublime in holiness, awesome in praise, and working wonders? You reached out with your right hand, the earth swallowed them. In your love, you led the people you redeemed. In your strength, you guided them to your holy abode. And the peoples have heard and they tremble. Anguish takes hold of those living in the sheet. Then the chiefs of Edom are dismayed. Trepidation seizes the heads of Moab. All those living in Canaan melted away. Terror and dread fell on them. By the might of your arm, they are still a stone. Until your people pass over, Lord, till your people you purchased pass over. 
You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain which is your heritage, the place, Lord, that you made your abode, the sanctuary, Lord, which your hands established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. For the horses of the Pharaoh went with his chariots and with his cavalry into the sea, but the Lord brought the sea waters back upon them, while the people of Israel walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. Amen. So we can see so many parallels here with what God is going to do in the last on that last day, whenever He's going to pour says even in verse seven that He's going to pour out His wrath. Just as he poured out his wrath upon Pharaoh, God is going to pour out his wrath upon the last Pharaoh, the Antichrist, and his evil empire, which we know ultimately is Satan and his um, evil kingdom. But all of this that we see in the next is chapter 15, so the people of God are singing um, in, in Revelation chapter 15. We see this, when, and he says, I, I love verse 16, it says, Until your people pass over, Lord, so the people that you purchased pass over. He purchased us by his blood, and that's what that first Passover was, a picture foreshadowing Yeshua, the Passover lamb. But it, it, it continues on in verse 20. It says, also Miriam the prophet, the sister of Aaron, she took a tambourine in her hand, and also all the women went out after her with tambourines dancing. As Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. And I just want to encourage you guys as women for a minute as I read that. That was actually the Torah portion for this week, was Exodus chapter 15. And as I begin to read that and study that, I just love how the rabbis draw this out. Because understand that they just came out of Egypt, but all of the women, led by Miriam, had prepared tambourines. Tambourines are a picture of rejoicing. So they knew that God was doing a miracle. They knew that there was going to be something to rejoice about. And so they had prepared these instruments ready to sing praises to God. Um, and I just believe that it's the faith of these women that was an encouragement for them during all of the midst of the judgments. And even as Pharaoh and his army came advancing, they had those tamarinds ready to rejoice that God was going to bring them safely to the other side. It reminds me of Psalm 68, 11 that says the women with the word are a great host. That God has put something unique inside of us as women to declare the word of God, to be an army, a Kyle army, announcing the good news of God, proclaiming that in faith that we become a support for, for the men and for other people as we declare the word of God, that it can be something that people rest upon. Because God has put that faith in us as women to be announcers of the good news to be carriers of the word, to come with tambourines, rejoicing in the victory of God. So I just love that, that picture that we see with Miriam. And it also reminds me of Proverbs 31, where it talks about the Proverbs 31 woman, which is really a picture of the last day's bride. One of the verses says that she laughs at the days to come. And I believe the reason why she laughs, even though the days are increasingly evil, she sees the end and she knows that God's victory is near. And so it's because of her faith and her trust and who God is and what he said that she can laugh at the days to come. She has a tambourine ready to rejoice. And even the name Miriam, it has two mims in it. And that mm -hmm. mim is a picture of living water. So Miriam was a, a, it was a cup of living water for the Israelites as they came out of Egypt as she sang and proclaimed God's goodness. And so here in Revelation 15, they, the people of God are also singing the song of Moses. And it says the song of the Lamb. And I don't know if you know this, but there are actually two songs of Moses. We're not going to sing the other, or we're not going to read the other one. But if you want to in your own time, read Deuteronomy chapter 32. I'm going to just point out um, two verses here in Deuteronomy chapter 32, which is another song of Moses, a very prophetic song. Um, in verse 3 and 4, it says, For I proclaim the name of the Lord. And this is directly um, connected to verse 3 in Revelation as it says, Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Here in um, Deuteronomy chapter 32, it says, For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. And I just love that here in this passage, Moses is calling him the rock. And we know that the rock is a picture of God. And in this whole story of Moses bringing Israel out of Egypt, when God, Moses strikes the rock, 
who we know is Yeshua, that Yeshua had to be struck before the water of life could be poured out of him. I just love that truth of Moses, just proclaiming that, that God is our rock. He's perfect and he's just. And he's talking about Yeshua, the rock of our salvation. Um, and, and just striking the rock, I just love to have that foreshadow is the death and the spirit being poured out as the water of life. Um, and so the second verse in Deuteronomy 32 I wanted to point out, it says this. If you notice in these verses 3 and 4, two times we see the word nations. It says, just and true are your ways, king of the nations. Verse 4, it says, all nations will come and worship before you. In verse 43 of Deuteronomy 32, it says, Rejoice, you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will take vengeance on his enemies and make atonement for his land and people. So what is happening here in this passage that Moses prophesied many thousand years before, he is saying that God... The nations are coming to rejoice with Israel. We've been grafted into the covenant. We've been brought near. And now this time, in this moment, God is going to atone for the land and for the people. And his atonement is going to come in the form of his wrath that's about to be poured out. And so this is what's happening in this passage. And I couldn't help but recognize who these people are. We have to go back to Revelation chapter 7. Okay? Revelation chapter 7 is the chapter where we see God put a seal on the 144,000. The first eight verses are about Israel, okay? But then verses 9 through the end of the chapter is about the nations. Verse 9, after this I looked and there before me a huge crowd, too large for anyone to count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They were standing in front of the throne, in front of the Lamb, dressed in white robes, holding palm branches, and they shouted, Victory to our God. Remember in Revelation chapter 7, John is getting a vision of the end. He is seeing the 144,000 who have been anointed and chosen by God. He is seeing those from the nations. And it says later in this chapter, they ask, Who are these dressed in white robes? Verse 14. He says, then he told me, these are the people who have come out of the great persecution. They have washed their robes in the, in the big sea, the labor. And they have been made white with the blood of the Lamb. They are before God's throne. So these people that John sees in Revelation 7 are the same that we see in Revelation 15. They have gone through the great persecution, the tribulation. They have been baptized by both water and fire. And now they're standing before the throne of God. So it's just very interesting when we can look back in these chapters and we saw the 144,000 again in Revelation chapter 14. Remember we talked about that last week. We saw them standing on Mount Zion with Yeshua. But then these same who have the nations... That God has been saying throughout the chap throughout these chapters, this is stand firm, persevere, you can do this, stay strong, be faithful to the end, you're gonna make it through. We see them raptured in Revelation chapter 14, and we see them now here before the throne of God in Revelation 15. So their destiny is the same as Israel. They are going to be with God and our Messiah. But they have joined together with Israel and they are singing the song of, of Moses and the song of the Lamb because they have been victorious. They have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they stand before God pure and holy and refined in His presence. And I believe what we're seeing are the nations here. What a miracle. Yes, what a miracle. And that's why I think this chapter, or verse 3 and 4, talks about the nations. I believe these are from Revelation 7, that these are the nations that have been far away, but have been brought near into the Holy, holy of Holies. And so the next thing that God does, verses 5 through 8, it says that um, the tent of witness, a better way to understand that is that the Holy of Holies is open, okay? Um, the Ark of the Covenant is revealed. We can. It's actually easier to read it in Revelation chapter 11. It says, The temple of God, this is verse 19, in heaven was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen in this temple. That's exactly what's happening in verse 5. It says the Ark, the, the tent of the witness in heaven is open, and you can see inside the sanctuary. 
And in the sanctuary are the seven angels with the seven final bowls that have got to wrap, they're about to pour out on the earth. But we have to remember the significance of the Holy of Holies. This is where God's presence is. This is where the glory cloud of God's presence dwells. And so this is open now, okay? Basically, inside the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, this is a very sacred, special thing. This is... You know, whenever Yeshua was buried and he was in the tomb, inside the tomb, that was like seeing into the Ark of the Covenant, okay? That stone that held the tomb was that veil in the temple. When that stone was removed inside there, where Yeshua's body was buried, was like looking into the Holy of Holies, okay? Yeshua, even as you, as Mary looked in, or as the Peter and John, I can't remember who it is, but they looked in, they saw two angels, just like the cherubim. Over the ark, okay? They see, see those two angels and inside. So Yeshua is a picture of what's inside the Ark of the Covenant. It's the Ten Commandments, or the Commandments of God. Yeshua is the living word. Also, Aaron's rod, he's the high priest. That's who Aaron is. It's a picture of the high priest. And then it's the Omer of grain, the first fruit offering. Yeshua is our first fruit offering. And so the Ark of the Covenant is a picture of Yeshua. Yeshua is a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. So what is being revealed here is the Ark of the Covenant is opening. We have Yeshua. <laughs> it's the revelation of Yeshua. Our king is coming on the cloud of God's presence. As the ark is being revealed, the king of kings is coming in victory to pour out his indignation and wrath upon the earth, but to redeem his own in the process. No, no more wow. type and foreshadowing. It's the real thing. <laughs> this is the real thing. <laughs> Yeshua is coming. The veil is being removed and Yeshua is being revealed. Okay. So for those who have not, the atoning sacrifice of Yeshua, that is, those who have rejected that blood covering, he comes now in wrath. He comes now in judgment. And there's a terrifying passage in Psalm 50 that is a messianic passage talking about the wrath of God. And this is Yeshua speaking. He says, I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. Do you guys remember this happening in the Gospels? Oh, yeah. They tore his beard. They, they hit his back. And so here in this, this passage, I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. The God of the universe allowed his beard to be pulled, his face to be spat upon, his back to be whipped. He says, For the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced, therefore I have set my face like flint. I know that I will not be ashamed. And this, the end of the passage reads this. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle, encircle yourself with firebrands, Walk in the light of your fire, and among the brands you have set ablaze. This you will have, for my hand you will lie down in torment. Can you imagine? The words of Yeshua, our suffering lamb, is coming like a lion from the tribe of Judah. Those who have plucked his beard and spit in his face and whipped his back. He says, at my hand, he will suffer torment. Which side do we want to be on? How do people continue to choose death when the wrath of the Almighty God who created the heavens and the earth is about to be poured out? It says in, in Zechariah, as it describes this, that their eyes pop out and their tongues are, I mean, it's just a horrific description of what's happening as the wrath of God is being poured out upon the earth. It's terrifying. But I, what's happening right now, as we talked about, remember this analogy of the seven times around Jericho. This is that last day. Remember we talked about each time that they marched around Jericho was like a year of the tribulation. One, The first time they marched around was the, seven, the first trumpet, and then the second trumpet. The, and then we get to the very last day. They march around seven times. This is a picture of the seven bold judgments that are being poured out before they go in and take the city and walk into their promise. And remember what they had 
as they marched, the Ark of the Covenant was right there in their midst. So the Ark of the Covenant is being revealed. It's a picture of Yeshua being revealed. They are about to meet their doom. So <clears throat> this is what's happening in this passage. I'm going to read one more passage in Isaiah chapter 26 that I believe kind of brings all of this together. If you want to open there. Um, Isaiah chapter 26. I'm going to read a few verses. I'm kind of hopping around. But I, I just believe that this is such a picture of the psalmist. I believe this is such a picture of what's happening right here in Revelation chapter 15. And it starts out, and I believe I start out with verse 1. It says, On that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. Remember what we just read in Revelation 15. They are holding harps and they're singing a song, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. It says, This song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. He has built walls and ramparts for our safety. Open the gates. Let the righteous nation enter, the nation that keeps faith. I believe that's talking about the nations of the earth that are coming into the kingdom of God. And then we, we move on, um, and I like to point out verse, verse 9, the last part of that verse. It says, um, for when your judgments are here on the earth, the people in the world learn what righteousness is. When God's judgments are in the earth, and this is talking about during the tribulation, the people learn what righteousness is. Even if pity is shown to the wicked, he still doesn't learn what righteousness is. So for those outside of covenant, even what God is trying to be merciful, they will still, even if God shows pity, they will not learn righteousness. And then move on to verse, verse 20. Come, my people, enter your chambers. Imagine the lament. Enter your chambers. Shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself for a little while until the wrath has passed by. For behold, the Lord is about to come out from his place. The ark is about to be revealed to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain. On that day, the Lord, with his great, strong, relentless sword, will punish Leviathan, and that's a fleeing serpent, which is Satan, the twisting serpent. He will slay the sea monster. So this chapter is a picture of the Sonic, of God inviting those from the nations, those from Israel who have come into covenant with him to be hidden in the bridal chamber while the wrath of God is poured out on the unbelievers and on the wicked kingdom. And so he becomes their strength their support, their surrounding, sheltering fire of protection as the wrath and the indignation of God is poured out. In the so, <coughs> yeah, there's, there's more that happens on the Day of Atonement because really this whole thing that's happening, whenever the veil is removed and the wrath is being poured out, that's the Day of Atonement. This is the final Day of Atonement. And God is going to atone for the nation, or the, the, for Israel. And, and part of that atonement is going to be the blood of those who come under his wrath. He's atoning for the land and for the people, and it's with the blood of the unbelievers. Um, but there's more that happens on that day, but I want to develop that more, and so I'm going to save it until next week because I feel like God might be revealing something. So, any questions?